the presentation itself should take about 30 to 40 minutes, so I would like to keep that 30 40 minutes for the presentation. And then uh, once uh, once we are done with the presentation, then I would like to take the questions that you might have. Uh, now at this point of time, as you all might be aware, that the uh, PCIDSS standard uh, version 3.0 is a issue. Um, and there are still a lot of questions that are being shared, a lot of uh, uh, doubts that people have. So um, I would try and do my best to ans answer your questions. If in case I'm not able to answer, then uh, I would like to take, take down the question and then we would uh, get back to you through mails uh, for these uh, questions as such. All right, so uh, just to set the uh, tone and the intent of this particular presentation, uh, what, what we plan to share today is to basically uh, uh, share the highlights from uh, the changes that we see in the version uh, PCIDSS version 3 and 3.0. Um, there are quite some changes. I probably wouldn't call them as a major change. It is an improvement in a lot of ways from the version 2.0. Uh, so this particular presentation would start with uh, looking at some of the um, reasons as to why the changes have come into place. Some of the um, uh, reasons as, as have been shared by the PCI Council um, and uh, the intent of the changes and then uh, we'll try and look at some of the changes as such. Uh, I might not be able to touch upon all the changes because they're quite, quite quite some of them, uh, but I would like to try and pick up the um, most obvious uh, changes that we see as of now. Um, and I'm sure that as, as the, uh, the, so the talking circles and the implementation structures move on this year, uh, we might probably be looking at more and more you know, detailing coming out for the uh, newer changes or the controls as such. Right, so uh, to start, uh, first, first of all, like I have shared, uh, the intention is to try and highlight the changes that we see in the PCIDSS version 3 and 3.0. Um, basic understanding is that uh, the audience who have logged into this particular session are probably aware of what PCIDSS 2.0 already has. Um, I've tried to structure my presentation such that I can, I can, uh, you know, try. Um, answer it in both in both versions in the now. We all are aware of the change in the standard, uh, the version of the standard as such. That is, we knew that version 2.0 is what currently is the PCIDSS version, and the new version is 3.3.0. Now, something that most of us are aware, of, but I would just like to uh, share share this point. The PCI Council itself has got a life cycle that they maintain for the standards. So. Each standard, each version of would be uh, would have a 36 months life cycle. Now, during this 36 months of life cycle, the council, uh, the council basically uh, gets a lot of feedback from the market, looks at what are the new trends, and then starts working on the upgrade of the versions. Um, so these are the major version change assets. So what we have seen, uh, the PCIDS is version 1.2, change to 2.0, and then now we are talking about the version 3 and 3.0. Um, just, just before I proceed, uh, I, I would just like to quickly check, is my voice clear? If, uh, or uh, would you, I mean, should I be a little more loud? Okay, all right. So um, apart from the fact that the uh, the uh, major changes in the standard version itself, which follows a 36 month life cycle, there are some of the um, uh, changes in terms of fine tuning the major release as such. For instance, 
uh, now that the version 3.0 is official, um, in the due course of time, the council keeps checking how exactly is this, um, uh, is this version of the standard being implemented or accepted and if there are any um, sudden uh, or if there are any you know minor changes that have to be done those would be released in terms of the errata chain changes um, now so trying to look at you know what are the uh, drivers for this particular change or you know what are the um, for the version PCIDS's version 3.0 to have the um, enhancements or the changes from the version 2, 2.0. What have been the major drivers? Now these drivers, what I have uh, tried to list down here, is based on the uh, uh, interactions that we have had with the council, is also based on our experience as a QSA that we see in, in the market and the same feedback has been shared with the council as part of the uh, community meetings. So during the community uh, count community meetings of the PCI and Sander to share in their views. Um, now some of the reasons for the changes are the evolving technologies as such. Uh, threats that we get to see now uh, based on I mean based based on the different breaches that are taking place. Um, a constant need of clarifying what is the intent of the requirement, what is the reason for a certain requirement that is being uh, pushed as part of the PCIDS standard. Feedback from, from, from the market, that is what I have shared. The lack of, uh, these are the common aspects that we as a QSA plus the feedback that we do receive or the responses that we did receive from the PCI Council. In fact, this is as latest as the, uh, the, the um, Asia PAC community meeting which took place in the month of November last year. This, uh, the version 3.0 was a major point of discussion during that particular session too. Um, some of the challenges that we personally as a QSA have seen which we strongly believe is one of the uh, is also the driver for these changes. Um, one that I would like to specify is the management process of the organizations to maintain the compliance to PCIDSS. What we have observed or what we see is that um, the first cycle of the implementation, the or organizations are usually uh, you know completely involved in the implementation and they all the effort in terms of implementing the requirements is seen the best of the efforts but the following year the requirements of the standard are such that it could be spread across that you know the, uh, there are activities to to be done on a daily basis weekly basis monthly basis quarterly basis this is where organizations usually uh, don't follow the requirements. And this is what has typically been the reason for the break in terms of the PCIDSS framework that is implemented. Some of the reasons being um, organizations look at PCIDSS as a one-time act activity and not as a continuous activity. The level of awareness about the standard and what needs to be followed is something that is not on the higher side. And these are the aspects that are also uh, captured or are also shared as a feedback with the PCI Council, which is one of the reasons why you find some of the changes in the version 3.0 now. Now, when, when we talk about 3.0, 3 um, what can I say in terms of an overall change? The overall change, I would definitely say that it's definitely an improvement when we uh, when we try and look at the version 2, 2.0. There's a lot more clarity that is brought into the standard in terms of what is the intent of the requirements. There's a lot more clarity that has been brought in with regard to how um, how uh, how is it that these requirements have to be uh, implemented and can continued with that particular implementation framework. 
in in terms of the assessment part there is not uh, any change that you would find uh, in as as in a qsa doing the assessments the overall core structure of the pcidss 2.0 that is the core 12 requirements of the standard is still maintained in the same way in the version 3.0 also now in terms of the visual look and feel that is when you pick up the pcidss requirements version 2.0 and if you pick up the PCID, uh, PCIDSS requirements 3.0 the visible changes that you can see is the 2.0 had the columns of the PCIDSS requirement, the testing procedure in place, not in place, target date and comments. Now the 3.0 has been changed um, and and just to also mention with regard to 2.0, the council had also released a navigation document, a, a document that basically explained the intent of each of the requirements. In the version 3.0, 3 uh, the council has included the navigation document as a part of the uh, this particular requirements document itself. So, you, you have the PCIDSS requirements now, the testing procedures, and the third column is the intent of each of the requirements. And definitely, I would say, if you, if you try to compare to 2.0 and 3.0, the clarity that the council has tried to bring in um, with, with regard to a lot of controls that were probably not that very clear, in the version 3.0 now, the clarity has been definitely uh, uh, shared as a part of the standard. Alright, so like, uh, like I had shared before, again just trying to look at the reasons for these changes, probably just trying to put them under uh, these heading that you see here, uh, lack of awareness, education. One of the aspects that uh, the council has been trying to push across uh, is with regard to the uh, awareness levels of be it the merchants or the service providers. Now this has been uh, one of the aspects that uh, also could probably lead to the extent of saying that you know the reason for a security breach is because an organization service provider is not really aware as to what is to be followed as part of the standard or you know what is it that uh, what are the best practices to follow with regard to the usage of the card data. Probably one of the points that I would like to show, uh, you know, present or, uh, you know, discuss over here is the acceptance of PCIDSS as such is only looked, as, looked at as a compliance requirement, which is what exactly the standard wants to change. Uh, the council would want to change with, you know, the, you know with the version 3, 3.0. It's not, it's not only a compliance requirement. It is, uh, it is probably the best practices that you can think of when dealing with the card data. Point num number two, the testing mechanisms, the, uh, the process of doing, uh, it, it could be the vulnerability assessments, the penetration testing, uh, the internal scans, ex ex external scans, or the whole process of the segmentation by itself. Uh, there have been instances where Clients have implemented segmentation, but there is no proper uh, check that is done, test that is done on these segments that have been created, which sort of led to breaches that the organization was not really aware of. Another major aspect, like I have uh, shared a little while back, the whole uh, point of considering PCI as a PCIDSS as a one-time act activity. That is, there's a, there's a gap in terms of who would be the owner to, to ensure the continued compliance of the standard. These have been some of the major reasons that have probably brought in the changes that we get to see in the version 3.0 3 now. Alright, so uh, what is it that uh, the uh, version 3.0 3 would like to em em emphasize upon? Uh, to consider the standard as a best practice in terms of the information security um, setup that you need to have when you're involved in using the card data. 
or when you're involved in uh, either processing, storing, or trans trans transmitting the card data. Consider PCI DSS as a methodology that you would follow. It, it has to become um, a business as usual act activity. It is not a one-time act, act activity. It is not something that you have to uh, prepare yourself before the audit is done because that um, that should definitely not work in line with you being compliant to the standard. All right. Uh, now just trying to get to the uh, changes in the version 3.0 as such. If you look at the changes in the in the PCI DSS version 3, 3.0, the changes are classified into clarifications, additional guidance, evolving requirements. Clarifications is basically uh, explaining the intent of the requirement a little more. They, um, and in, in this particular PCI DSS version 3.0, the council has defined or given more clarifications for some of the uh, controls that were probably not that very clear. During my presentation today, I'm, I would probably not uh, stress more upon the clarification because the intent has been the same from the version 2.0 to the version 3.0. 3 probably where I, I, I would try to spend a little more time would be in terms of the evolving requirements as these are the, these are the new requirements which have uh, come into the PCI DSS version 3.0. Okay. Now trying to look at the, uh, the summary of the changes. Now I'm specifically talking about the clarifications like what I had shown in my previous slide. Um, and the the table that you see on the left side basically just gives the number of changes or the additional clarifications that have been uh, given in each of the requirements. Um, for your reference on the right side I have also listed down what are the requirements so you basically get to see that requirement one which basically talks about install and maintain a firewall configuration. There are six um, additional uh, clarifications that the council has brought into in the in the PCI DSS version 3.0. Similarly, you have the requirement 2, 3, 4, 5 and uh, the clarifications have been provided for each of these sections. I would, uh, okay, this was in terms of the clarifications. In terms of the evolving requirements, if you look at the slide that I have up here now, there are about 20 evolving requirements that the PCI DSS version 3.0 has brought, brought into place. Um, again, I have listed the new uh, evolving requirements as per the core 12 requirements of the standard. So, uh, requirement 1 has two uh, new requirements which has come into place. Similarly, requirement 2 has one. Um, I would try um, and in the course of my presentation today, I have, tr I have actually tried to concentrate more on these evolving requirements that, uh, that it would help the group that has joined this particular presentation to basically understand what are the changes, what does it mean that uh, you would have to do when you have to move from version 2.0 to version 3.0. In terms of the additional guidance, uh, we have 11.2 that has been, uh, so basically the, uh, um, in, in terms of the clarifying the requirement, in terms of uh, additional guidance that is required, uh, there is this one 3.0. Some highlights that uh, the uh, PCI DSS 3 and 3.0 assessment procedure itself has uh, clearly talks or states um, in, in terms of the initial um, few pages of the procedure. 
the version 2, 2.0 and the version now, that is the 3.0 version, have got some distinct changes and the council has tried to bring in more clarity with regard to some of the aspects. Like if you look at the first point, uh, the version 3.0 now clearly states sensitive authentication data must not be stored after authorization even if PAN is not being stored in the setup. Um, there was some amount of discussions that we as a QSA have also had with a lot of clients uh, that, that we have is how would you consider sensitive authentication data as, uh, as a part of the card data when I don't have the, uh, the PAN number being stored. So this is a clarity that the council has now brought in in the version 3.0 where they clearly state that um, irrespective of the fact that an organization stores the uh, PAN numbers or not, sensitive authentication data itself cannot be stored neither in uh, an encrypted form. Post authorization, uh, the SAT data cannot be stored. The version 3.0 has also explained about the relationship between PCI DSS and PA DSS a little more. Uh, probably what I would like to share uh, for this particular point is uh, from our experience again, um, the, the notion that many organizations have that if they, if they purchase, procure a PA DSS certified application and install it in their setup, then they would automatically comply to the requirement of PCI DSS. This to an extent is not uh, really true. Reason being, all the PA DSS certified applications, they come with a guideline that uh, in, in, in terms of how these applications have to be installed, how these applications have to be configured. If the organization does not follow that guideline that has been shared with the PADS certified application, then you are not in compliance to PCIDS. It's only when you implement the application in line with the guidelines that you, you, can, uh, you can be rest assured that the application would comply to all the requirements of PCIDS. So some amount of clarity that the PCIDSS version 3.0 has brought in uh, with regard to the explaining this aspect also. Um, all right, and, and the rest is what we, we would be basically seeing as we move on with this particular presentation. I, I would be basically sharing the minor changes, uh, but um, uh, visibly what you can see in the version 3.0 is there are a lot of uh, change in terms of the wording that the standard uh, that the council has used. For example, um, 2.0 talks about implementing FIM, file integrity monitoring. Now in the version 3.0, 3 they have actually changed this uh, to use terms like a mechanism to identify changes to the critical files instead of uh, referring to it as FIM, as a requirement of FIM, they have changed it to, uh, the, to a wording which says that a mechanism. All right, um, now starting with the clarifications as such, and I'm looking at requirement one, two, three. I have just picked a few of the points. This, this is definitely not the entire list of the clarifications as such. If you look at the requirement 1.1x, uh, the PCIDSS version 3.0 clearly um, segregates the documentation requirement and the implementation requirement. So one, this uh, one change is common to most of the um, requirements of the standard in 3.0. The council has visibly segregated the documentation related checks and the implementation related re requirements and um, just just to jump uh, some some of the slides a little because this point uh, is probably a, a little more relevant to the discussion that we are having here. Um, the requirement 12 which 
concentrates more in terms of the policies and procedures in uh, as per the version 2 2.0 in the newer version 3.0 the requirement 12 in terms of the policies and procedures has been spread across all the 12 requirements of the standard essentially trying to bring in the importance of policies procedures for each of the requirements and that uh, uh, that there's no slippage in terms of ensuring that the framework itself the PCIDSS framework itself in an organization becomes a little more stronger. Then looking at the requirement 1.1.6 previously in the version 2 2.0 this was 1.1.5 there is more clarification that is brought into the new version in terms of um, listing down the examples of insecure services, the protocols, ports. Um, then the requirement 1, 1 1.5 which was not present in the 2, 2, 2 2.0, it is more uh, a documentation related requirement and that it clearly mandates that you know uh, these set of policies and procedures should exist in an order organization and that is being very specific to the requirement one that talks about the firewall aspects. Um, some of the highlights from the requirement two uh, clarify that the re requirement for changing vendor default password applies to all default passwords including system application security software terminals so the uh, clarity that they have brought in terms of wording the intent of the requirement in version 3.0 for this particular requirement is a little more detailed now. Uh, similarly, when, when we look at the requirement 3.5.2, um, okay, just, just to share in, in my presentation, wherever I have mentioned in bracket previous 1.1.5 or previous 3.5.2, this refers to the PCIDSS version 2.0. What I have stated as the requirement is as per the version 3.0. Okay, now uh, the version 2, 2.0 did talk um, or did have um, clarity in terms of how the key management process should work. What has been done in the version 3.0 now, there's a lot more detailing that has been brought in in terms of clarifying the intent of how the split key has, has to be uh, used or the dual control of the keys if there is a manual um, encryption keys which are being used. Such kind of clarity is what you find in the version 3, 3.0. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, looking at the requirements for 4.1, the, um, the explanation in terms of what, is, what are all the examples of open public networks. Uh, just to, this is a snapshot from the PCIDSS 3, 3.0. So if you look at it, uh, the, the block which you see on the left side um, is version 2.0. The one that you see on the right is the version 3, 3.0. So now the examples that they have mentioned. So they are, uh, so the standard is making it a little more clear in terms of what does it mean, what does it mean when they use the term open or public network. Uh, basically listing down the examples as the internet, the wireless technologies, uh, uh, GSM, CDMA, GPRS, satellite connections. Um, so some of the enhancements that um, the council has brought in into this particular stand, uh, sorry, this particular version. Then going back to requirement five, um, a common misconception or a common understanding that many organizations have is that the requirement five basically talks about Windows systems, and this has been a debate for in, in a lot of circles, many QSAs, uh, you know, basically go with the fact saying that, okay, Windows are the most vulnerable system, so we are looking at antivirus only for Windows systems, uh, which is not the right uh, thing. The, uh, the intent of this particular requirement from 2.0 itself was never to limit it to only Windows systems. Version 3.0 brings in more 
uh, clarity in explaining the exact intent of the requirement five, which basically says um, commonly affected platforms. Windows definitely is a commonly affected platforms, but that doesn't mean the rest of the platforms are not. As the uh, the threat landscape uh, changes, as the risks keep increasing or changing, today we are seeing the rest of the platforms also um, uh, being impacted because of malware or viruses. So requirement 5 now as part of 3 3.0 has brought in more clarity and mandates the organizations to constantly check for each of the platforms that they have and, and to see if there are any such instances. So, so if yes, I mean if there is an instance that is found that there, there are malware or there are different types of viruses then the organization would definitely have to look at in, uh, you know, implementing the antivirus for those platforms too. Um, uh, moving on to the next line, requirements 6.1 which previously was 6.2. So there is some reordering and restructuring in terms of the requirement numbers that you get to see in the new version. Uh, which is again keeping in mind that there are certain new controls which have brought, uh, which have been brought into place. A lot more um, explanation that has been given. The the requirements have been split into multiple uh, sets to basically differentiate between the documentation and the implementation part. So there are uh, you know they, there are certain switching in terms of the requirement numbers and specific. Uh, Specifically, with regard to the requirement 6.1 and 2, uh, the understanding was that uh, the requirement 6.2, as in uh, as per the version 2 and 2.0, logically is the first stage when you talk about any change management process. So that logical switch is what they have brought by uh, renumbering the requirement, the previous requirement 6.2 to 6.1 now. Okay. Um, now looking at the requirement eight, um, there are some generic changes that has has been brought brought into place. Uh, there are changes uh, that actually give a little more um, flexibility to all organizations in terms of the implementation part. For instance, if I if I look at uh, okay, that that would be uh, actually coming as a part of the evolving changes, so I would take that point a little later in the following slides. Uh, but for now, when, when we talk about the clarifications, um, there is a little more clarity that uh, the new version has brought with regard to, let's take the example of the requirement 8, 8.3, which clarifies that two-factor authentication applies to users, admin, and all third party, including vendors who access um, even for a support maintenance kind of a work. So any external access to the card data environment, two-factor authentication would apply. So the intent has been the same as part of version, uh, the previous version and this version. It is just the detailing that has changed in the new version. Requirement 9.2 9 clarifies the intent of the requirement to identify, distinguish, um, and grant access to on-site personal visitors and the batches are just one option. So uh, if you look at the previous version, it looked like the, uh, that the batches were the only way in which uh, this particular requirement could be met. 3.0 is now looking at um, all the possible controls that an organization can have that can suffice this particular need. So it says that batches is just one of the options. So if there is another existing process that you have that essentially mitigates the risk coming out of this particular requirement, that can be considered as a control or as, uh, as a mechanism to mitigate the risk from this particular uh, check. Requirement 10.1 10, 10 
clarifies that audit trails should be implemented to link access to system components to each individual user rather than just establishing a process. Um, some wrong conception or wrong um, understanding um, of the requirement 10.10.1 10 due to the wording that was uh, present in the version 2, 2.0 is what they have clarified now in the version 3.0. Requirement 11.2.1 uh, uh, clarifies that quarterly in uh, quarterly internal vulnerability scans include rescans as needed until all high vulnerabilities as identified by PCI requirement 6.1 are resolved and must be performed by qualified personnel. Essentially, uh, the intent has been the same. Even the previous version did talk about the rescans. Uh, the new version now re-emphasizes the whole point and says that the rescans are a must to basically uh, to, until the high findings have been closed and the uh, scans show that these uh, these vulnerabilities no longer exist. So that rescan uh, approach or uh, aspect is what is being re-emphasized as a part of the new version now. Um, and this, the next point is what I had shared a little while back. Uh, so, the the previous requirement 12.1.1 and 12.2, which was essentially looking at the uh, information of the policy, the information security policy, or the policies and procedures that an organization needs to have in place. This is now split into each of the uh, requirement of the standard. So you find policies and procedures being checked or being referred to in the requirement 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 till the requirement 11 as part of the version 3, 3.0. Um, intent of this particular change is to ensure that the PCIDSS framework that an organization has in place is not only restricted to, you know, uh, just one section of the standard, so so the importance of it is missed out. But to basically ensure that the policy procedure related checks are in place for each of the requirements as as you as you start from the first requirement of the standard till you move till 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 the last. So the intention is to try and ensure so that the framework itself becomes much more stronger. It is quite I mean it's clearly art, articulated that. Um, the importance of the policies and procedures is very high to ensure that framework doesn't break and it does and that an organization does sustain that framework um, as a part of you know as a as a part of uh, the business as usual processes that they have in place all right uh, so the previous slides was in terms of the clarity and that the standard has brought into place with regard to giving more details or you know explaining the intent of the standard more. From here, I'm looking at the evolving requirements as such. So these are the new requirements of uh, the PCIDSS 3.0. 3 um, some of them have have been again um, the intent was present in the older version, but it was not clearly defined as to what uh, has to be the checking process or what has to be the um, the plan do checked act uh, you know cycle for these particular um, controls. So that has been clearly defined as a part of um, the the new version now. So if if I look at the requirement one. There, uh, there is requirement 1.1.2 and 1.1.3. Uh, previously, 1.1.2, the network diagrams must include an added new um, requirement as 1.1.3 for a current diagram that shows card data flows. Um, I have brought in another column. In the, if you see, uh, if you look at this particular tape, table in the, to to the right side, that is the change impact. Uh, this is where I would I, I, I would like to discuss what does it mean? What does this new requirement as such mean for an or, organization? Now, as part of the PCIDSS work that we have also done for a lot of clients, 
we, uh, we see that there is a network diagram that is maintained by all the organizations. There is a subset of that overall network diagram that basically just highlights the systems, the network uh, components that are part of the PCI-DSS scope. Now version 3.0 is clearly mandating that uh, creation of card data flows. That is all the systems, network devices, wherever the card data traverses, that flow also has to be um, documented, captured by the or, or, or organizations. Then looking at the change in the uh, the new requirement in the in the requirement two of the standard that is two point four that mandates a uh, new requirement to maintain an inventory of system components uh, in scope for PCI DSS to support development of configuration standards. Now the version two two point zero did uh, talk about maintaining uh, con configuration standards. It spoke about maintaining a cardholder matrix or an inventory of all the systems that are there in the PCI DSS scope. 3.0 basically is linking these both and stating that as part of your inventory, you have to maintain an inventory of all the systems, uh, network devices, all, uh, all the um, assets that fall in the scope of PCI DSS that can be clubbed and the people uh, and the tech, uh, sorry, the process and the technology part. Um, the in inventory of the same has to be maintained and using that as the basis, the organization has to uh, maintain the configuration standards for all the different platforms that they have. Then, uh, there are no new um, requirements or a additions in the requirement 3 and 4 of the standard as such apart from the clarifications that they have brought which we have discussed in the slides uh, before. Uh, coming down to the requirement 5, this is what I had also shared uh, before. Re requirement 5.1.2. Requirement to evaluate evolving malware threats for any system not considered to be commonly affected by by malicious software. The term uh, commonly affected systems was some, some, something was, uh, that was interpreted in different ways by uh, be it by a QSA or be it by an or organization that is trying to implement these ideas. 3.0, 3 the new standard brings in more clarity and states or makes it very clear the intent of 5.1.2 is not only the uh, the so-called commonly affected systems, which used to be considered as the Windows systems, but for an organization to also be aware that there are other plat platforms that could have um, a malware or any kind of a malicious software. So if you look at the next slide too, that is the requirement 5.3. This is also linked to the previous um, 5.1.2. 5, 5 that is, this uh, re requirement to ensure that antivirus solutions are uh, actively running. Formerly, this was 5.2 5, 5 and cannot be disabled or altered by users unless specifically authorized. So they have brought in uh, additional level of control when we talk about the antivirus. And if there is a need for the antivirus to be uh, temporarily disabled or altered for any certain changes. Now that sort of a change of, uh, as part of the new requirement now has to follow the change process. Has to go through a change process where basically it clearly states what is the intent, why is it and it has to be a time based uh, change. It cannot be a permanent change. Now looking at the requirements 6 and 8 of the standard. Requirement 6, there's a new uh, requirement that is 6.5.10. Um, this is for coding practices to protect against broken authentication and session management. 
Uh, we are aware as part of Tune 2.0, the standard does give a list of all the possible um, threats that uh, that can be that can come into picture when you talk about any application that is being developed. So the 2.0 spoke about SQL injection, spoke about different types. Now, um, as part of the evolving changes, as part of the newer threats that are coming into place, 3.0 basically talks about broken on authentication and session management. Post 1st of July 2015, till then, this, these, two, uh, these two aspects as such, it's good to have uh, a check related uh, to these two uh, aspects. But post uh, 1st of July, this becomes a mandatory requirement as such. So the uh, testing procedures itself uh, on the coding aspects should cover these two uh, points as well. Then if you look at uh, the requirement 8, specifically talking about 8.2.3, um, the term, the previous version, that is 2.0, talks about passwords. And the option of the passphrases was never actually uh, you know, documented or seen as a part of the previous version. That is a change that uh, the new version has now brought into picture. So combine minimum password com complexity and strength re requirements into single requirement and increase flexibility for alternatives that meet equivalent com complexity and strength. Certain challenges that even we have seen uh, in, in uh, the organizations is when there are certain uh, passwords that cannot be changed due to uh, the technical challenge, that is, the system itself does not allow for these passwords to be changed. So now, uh, the version 3.0 is actually uh, looking at alternate ways in which you can um, still ensure that the risk is mitigated, but there, there could be other ways in which the same could be achieved. So that flexibility is what uh, this particular new version has brought into place now. Then looking at 8.5.1, um, requirement for service providers with remote access to customer premises uh, to use unique or authentication credentials. Again, uh, again the fact of uh, the service provider. So one another major aspect that uh, version 3.0 uh, is trying to bring into place is the third party related checks and balances. This is what uh, they, they have, uh, I mean the council has all also shared as one of the reasons uh, for the breaches that have taken place in the recent past. That is, or organizations not really being aware as to what are the requirements that a service provider would have to comply to. Uh, are they in compliance to these particular requirements or not? Or if they access their setup, then what is the mechanism that that is to be used? So, such uh, real, uh, so controls to ensure that such kind of risks are, are mitigated is what you get to see now in this new version. Uh, I'm just trying to keep a track of the time also. I think I'm running a little low on time. Uh, so moving on to the next. Right, uh, 9.3, probably another area that has brought in quite some uh, considerable amount of change. Nothing of this was present uh, in the version 2.0. 2 uh, 9.3 and 9.9. .9. Uh, these, okay, sorry, 9.3 specifically talks about the um, base, um, I mean, the physical access of for the members where uh, to the so-called sensitive areas. Um, On-site personnel, any person, it could be uh, it could be the staff member, it could be a third party. That control mechanism, uh, you know, mechanism has to be in place. Now, how ma how could this impact as such? Based on the setup that are there, they, this might also uh, get into um, a stage where 
um, organizations may have to look at you know actually creating newer physical uh, segmentations that is it could be like an enclosed uh, space that is uh, for uh, the teams that are considered as or team or for the areas that are considered as for uh, for those particular regions itself and then if you look at 9 9.9 9.9 uh, basically is a new requirement which talks about uh, the point of sale terminals so to protect the devices that capture so wherever there's a physical swipe essentially the point of sale devices um, for any sort of uh, checks to be done to ensure any sort of tampering or any sort of changes that might that might be physically done on the devices so this is a new requirement that has been brought in now uh, what could this lead to uh, this might if, uh, this could eventually lead to a lot of training and awareness that would have to be brought in to the merchants where the point of sale devices are being used because they, they would have to get into a, a process of doing a physical check. It could be as simple as, you know, is there any additional wire that is connected to the POS device? Is there any additional device that is getting connected to the POS device? Something that was not there before some such kind of changes changes in terms of does it look like the pass machine itself has been opened or you know there's some sort of a uh, tampering evidence which is seen so these are the kind of um, checks that uh, would have to be brought in which means that there there would be considerable amount of um, effort going into training the members to as to how these checks are are to, are to be done then requirement 10 uh, uh, essentially 10.2 to 2.5 uh, enhanced requirement to include changes to identification and authentication mechanism including creation of new accounts elevation of privileges so we are all aware as to all the logging requirements that has been um, that is pre you know present as part of 2.0 also the newer version uh, clearly states the intent and goes up to the extent of saying that any changes in terms of even creating a new account, changing the level of the privileges also has to be captured as a part, part of the logs. What could this translate into? Uh, this could probably translate into um, a higher level of logging itself to be enabled on the devices. Similarly, when we look at 10.2 to 2.6, enhanced requirement to include stopping or pausing of the audit logs. So, they, uh, the, the new version now clearly states that any time the audit logs is stopped from being captured or has, has is re-initiated, these details also have to be captured as a part of the logs as uh, to, to basically keep a track of who and what have uh, and why in that particular change. Then looking at the requirement 11, um, enhanced requirement to in include an inventory of authorized wireless access point and a business justification to support scanning for unauthorized wireless devices and added new requirement 11.1.2 uh, to align with an already existing testing procedure that is uh, clubbing the incident management uh, procedures to any incidents of any unauthorized uh, wireless access points which are seen. Uh, the overall um, intent to meet this particular intent I don't foresee any major changes apart from the uh, already existing inventory of all the systems that are in scope of PCIDSS. That inventory should clearly also list down all the wireless access points which, uh, which the organization owns. So that is the authorized wireless access point. So in the event there is um, any unauthorized access point that is discovered. So the uh, control mechanism to check is to basically validate um, is this particular access point a part of the authorized inventory list or not. So, so that is the change that you see as a part of the 11.1. 11.3 
requirement to implement a methodology for penetration testing. Um, this uh, again becomes effective from 1st of July 2015. Um, probably another way uh, as to how I would uh, you know share the intent of this. There have been instances that we, we, we have seen that clients have said I'm doing a penetration test and that penetration test essentially meant bringing in an external laptop trying to connect it uh, to any of the network uh, ports in the setup and run scan tools. Now with the basic security aspects that is you know uh, an external laptop cannot connect to an internal setup. All the scans which were run using these tools showed uh, a clean scan that is no uh, you know penetration was possible. That mechanism as to what is the kind of penetration test that has to be carried out was not clearly evident as part of in the old version. 3.0 now clearly states it's not the same but to use um, you know uh, NIST SP800115 uh, or any methodology that is equivalent or meets that same um, intent of what a penetration test has, uh, has to be. Then 11.3.4 specifically states, uh, this again, uh, this is uh, one of the, um, you know, one of the presentations which was uh, done by the PCI Council that I, I had also attended. Um, the example that they shared is many organizations have started uh, bringing in segmentations to basically reduce the scope of PCIDFs. Uh, you know, the, uh, the scope of PCIDSS, which is a very good thing. So it's essentially organizations are, uh, do understand that, you know, segmenting the setup can create uh, a smaller scope for PCIDSS. However, these segments itself were not being tested as to uh, is the segmentation being done properly. Uh, the, the kind of rules that have been defined to create this particular seg segment are these rules uh, strong enough or not? Would they give rise to any sort of a breach? So, and this, uh, and there have been practical instances where um, they, they, they have been breaches despite the segmentation being done and that is because of the kind of uh, improper segmentation which was done. So essentially 11.3.4 um, is a new requirement that they clearly state that if there is a segmentation that is done as a part of the PCIDSS scope, then the penetration test should clearly demonstrate that the segments that have been created is uh, is is uh, is at par with all the security practices. The rules that have been defined does not allow any un unauthorized access or a breach. So that so these segments as such. The, the configuration of the segmentation has to be covered as a part of the penetration test. 11.5.1, uh, um, let me just try and try to be a little more faster. Uh, requirement to implement a process to respond to any alerts generated by the change in detection mechanism. Previously the term which was being used was uh, the standard would say uh, um, any alerts being raised from IPS or Ideas. Now they have changed the, the verbiage and, and they basically say change detection mechanism. So linking of the incident response or um, an alert mechanism and a process to respond to the alerts. Uh, I don't see any significant change as such required for, uh, for these points uh, that we, we, we have shared. Um, in, in terms of an organization moving from PCIDSS version 2.0 to 3. Let's look at the last two uh, points too. 12.8.5 uh, requirement to maintain information uh, about which PCIDSS requirements are managed uh, by each service provider and which are managed by the entity. So as I shared before the council is trying to bring in uh, more clarity uh, that an organization needs to maintain with regard to the kind of uh, agreement that an organization has with its service provider. 
if an organization has a service provider that is involved in some way uh, with the card data, then the kind of uh, the uh, the service provider should, I mean, by default should actually uh, you know um, sign off in terms of managing the security of the card data of the or organization. And when I use the word sign sign off, uh, what I mean is in in in, in terms of a contractual. Uh, agreement which is what we see in 12.9 a requirement for service providers to provide a written agreements acknowledgements to their customers as specific uh, as as specified at, uh, uh, at the requirement 12, 12.8 so essentially post 1st of J July these agreements are something that have to be in place, so it's more of a mandate that the uh, the parent organization should have and uh, have an agreement with the third parties, with the service providers, especially where there is card data involved. All right. Um, so these um, those were the uh, were the new requirements as such uh, in enhancements or the newer changes that you get to see with regard to the version three. 3.0. Now, what does it mean in terms of the timelines? Uh, the version 3 in 3.0 was officially released in November last last year. As of 1st of Jan this year, the version is uh, 3.0 is effective. Organizations that are compliant to PCI DSS 2.0 have to uh, have to get certified to version 3 by 2015. Um, so as also shared by, by by the council, it it doesn't mean um, if um, currently you are compliant to two two point zero, then there's nothing that basically stops you to uh, to move into version three point zero in this current year also. Uh, it's in in fact it would be a good thing, uh, and the council also encourages the or organization to move into 3.0 in this particular current year too. Way forward, the what what we see, what what would it take for a for an or no, an organization that is already certified to 2.0 to move to 3.0? Uh, we have seen the highlights of the changes uh, that we have discussed in the slides before. There there would be some amount of assessment that an or organization would have to take up to essentially understand where do they stand as against the new version. Now this can be something that can be done internally provided uh, the internal resource is clear, uh, you know, is aware of what are the changes and what does the version 2, 2.0 state or what is the version 3.0 state. But the way forward would be to essentially conduct a gap assessment to identify are there any gaps. Uh, the way the way we if you are in compliance to aspects that would have to be considered to essentially get to that um, to the compliance levels of three point zero, um, and if it is for an or, or organization that has not yet implemented any of the versions. The best way forward would be to start implementing with the 3.0 version itself, and not to get, uh, not to start with 2.0 now and then try and you know move into the uh, to the upgraded version. Right, so that essentially uh, brings me to uh, the end end of the presentation. And uh, as as I had stated before, my in intention was to uh, basically share the changes, what is to be expected as part of the new PCIDSS version 3.0, uh, what probably could be the impact. Again, I I do un understand that the impact would differ from each setup. So uh, based on the setup, based on the all 